Okay, I think uh, we should move the conversation to the audience. Please, anybody who's got a question, raise your hand and we'll have a mic uh, sent to you. Ashwin. Yeah, um, there's something I just want to know, um, and Nimrat, you especially, with a film like this and being, and being the two leads, you never actually met in the film. Um, while shooting it, I mean, how did you tackle that? I mean, when you see the movie later, of course, you're the cast and you're together and it's great. But it's two separate people acting throughout the movie. And um, even, I wouldn't know how that is actually for something like this because when it comes out, you know, it's, it's such an ensemble as it is. But even for you as a director, I mean, uh, it, tackling the separate shooting completely, it's just, it would be very, very interesting to know how that was. Um, I think somewhere when I read the script, I knew that um, there was very little acting as such, you know, because classically acting is a lot of reacting and, you know, you need somebody to play off. Um, it was just uh, basically a lot of being, you know, that's what spoke to me instantly from a first read was that I just have to be and I just need to come to that place where I don't need to do too much. You know, because uh, it would just be an, uh, it would just stick out like a sore thumb. And somewhere, uh, for the lack of a better word, I know Gulshan there <laughs> hates this word, but every film has a sur. So uh, the sur of the film was for me. No, not Gulshan Grover, it's... Uh... <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> Gulshan. <laughs> he just asked him if it was Gulshan But he's the new bad boy. <laughs> he's, he's a badder man. That's Gulshan Deva, yeah. <laughs> So, um, so there was an inherent music uh, somewhere, as Irfan has also put it so uh, eloquently in one of our interviews before, you know, that there is an inherent poetry and a music in the film. And even though you don't really necessarily play off each other, but uh, somewhere we ne I needed to catch on to that fine thread that uh, attached the both of us. <clears throat> you know, that for me was extremely important to not go, um, uh, you know, go into my own world of what it is I need to do. And Ritesh was a great checkpoint. I mean, he was really a lighthouse there. Actually, I think if I'm not mistaken, they were treated as two separate films is what one of the things that I remember discussing with Ritesh very early on, that they're going to be like two separate films and they're going to come together. So uh, it just became really lovely and beautiful eventually. Uh, uh, that's a pretty interesting point. Ritesh, how did you shoot the film? I mean, did you shoot with each yeah. actor individually at one yeah, go? I mean, yeah, no, we had separate shoots. So we had, we first shot with Irfan's story and then we had uh, Ila's story. Uh, but it was two separate films for me, just from sort of the visual point of view. Uh, because of these two worlds, you know, uh, Ila's world is just restricted in this one apartment. And that was also a big reason for casting Nimrat because, you know, uh, this sense of just being, uh, and she's alone most of the time, and then and that apartment would have to look lived in, not like a set, and it needed to be someone who would be willing to put in the prep for that, you know, spend time. Uh, before the shoot, I would always find excuses for us to spend time in that apartment, and Nimrit also got involved in the production design, and the rehearsals was really just an excuse uh, for Ila's story, but I just wanted us to spend a lot of time in that place, so, you know, that place is lived in. So we actually got the apartment really early on. The, the production design was going on simultaneously. And about four months before the shoot, we started meeting there and talking about the script, rehearsing scenes. And, and in our initial meetings, I knew she was, she, she was willing to put in that. Because each time I would meet her, she would come with a new list of questions. You know, she would have tapped through the script and, and, and she would have some you know, 20 new questions for me. Uh, this was even before she was cast. Uh, but visually, it was like uh, the way the DOP and I worked together, uh, I always told him that, you know, we have to pretend like we are on, we are making sort of, you know, in Iranian cinema, you're always on sticks often. And so when we were in Sajan's story and there's this sort of, he has this routine and uh, sort of the same thing every day and we decided to be on sticks there. And in Ila's story, we were shooting this actual small apartment in Malad and the options for, for the different ways we could shoot her were very restricted. Uh, and that's where also th uh, the prep with her was much more uh, because there needed to be a lot just there, even though, you know, there was not, we didn't have too many uh, sort of options to, you know, use the camera to make things interesting. Uh, and, and she's very interesting on camera. 
So uh, our prep really came in there. So in that regard, sort of the way we used the camera, it was like shooting two different films. There was a different sort of visual logic to both shoots. But otherwise, I think in all other respects, in, in my mind, it was always, you know, one one movie. It was always action, sort of reaction um, between them. Yeah, I mean, I didn't have have the, have it mapped out because you know movies are really crafted on the editing table. See, for me, it was the first experience where uh, where uh, you do a scene and there the consecutive scenes. You know, you are not there. You don't know how they are going to shape up. So you, as an actor, you are not reacting to those scenes. So it's like there's a music, and you play a beat, and you don't hear anything. Then again, you play a beat, you don't hear anything. And you trust the conductor right. that the whatever the fill in the blanks would be there, they will match right. the beat and there will be music. Questions, Supratik. Uh, actually, could you just please my, uh, pass the mic here first? Supratik will just come back to you. Yeah, hi, guys. Uh, one, firstly, uh, kudos to the casting director. I think the casting was spot on. And secondly, the end of the movie, the way you left it, did you all leave it to the audience for multiple perceptions as to how the story would play out later on? Uh, yeah, I mean, about the ending, I think, uh, yeah, what do you think, you know, I mean? Back what to you. what I think yeah. was uh, mm. probably Irfan went to her place and uh, they must have taken off to Bhutan together, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> so you know, that's, that's lovely, you know, because we had a... Uh, when we were screening in Toronto, uh, someone came up to me and said, that's such a lovely movie, and, uh, but why did she have to go up in the end and kill herself? Uh, <laughs> and, uh, but, that, but that's great, you know, everyone brings their life to the movie, and, and you, know, you have a good life, apparently. Uh, I have two questions as well. Uh, one is, um, how did you uh, shoot the Dabbawala sequences? Uh, it seemed like there were, uh, you used a couple of different kinds of... Uh, like I think digital and film or something, like, if I'm not mistaken, because they, the footage looks a little different in some of the scenes. Uh, secondly, um, what uh, what was the reason? I mean, it seemed that like there was a very deliberate attempt for Irfan's character to speak in English in the letters and uh, Nimrat's character to uh, speak in Hindi. Like, and her character was not someone who did not clearly did not know English. She was from a middle class background and. She could have probably uh, written back in English as well. So, hmm. what is the reason for that? About the Dabbawala's, uh, all these two-part questions. Uh, <laughs> multiple choice. Uh, but uh, uh, about the Dabbawala's, we, after we finished the shoot with the principal actors, this was like 29 days, uh, just me and the DOP, Michael, we went around for six days and we shot with the Dabbawala's. So, we put our sort of a green Dabba into the system and we followed it a little bit. Then every now and then we would stage it, you know, like outside the train, get a sexy shot from in. So we, we were just, just two of us going and sort of following the system because there's no way to duplicate that, you know. So we would just start with them in Malad, go to church gate, uh, go get lunch, come back with them. Uh, and then I did a similar thing because uh, that time we didn't get any sound. Then our sound designer came down from Germany. Then it was me and the sound designer no camera, just going and recording sounds. Because by this time we had an edited sequence with no sound. So then we recorded the sound for it separately and then sort of designed it. Uh, but, uh, and we shot with the same camera actually. We shot with like a Sony F3 or something. Really basic digital camera. But then we had a very hard time when we were coloring the film. Because you know, it's everything else was in the RE Alexa and, and this. But we worked really sort of, that was the most sort of meticulous part about the DI. We had to put a lot of masks and we had to make our dabba pop in certain scenes because it's this dull green, you know, and it's supposed to blend in and yet stand out. And that's why we chose that color because uh, at the time of the shoot, we thought, you know, this sort of green. And then when we were coloring it, we thought, we thought it was too dull. So we made it pop here and there. So that's probably what makes some shots look different. Uh, and about the letters, I think it was just the, uh, the most important thing was what is the language of their hearts, you know? Uh, and that's what the, that's the language in, in which the letters should be. And I mean, Irfan can speak to this as well because we had a lot of conversations at one point about, uh, you know, you, you sort of, uh, a lot of, lot of opinions come at you and people tell you, oh, make this all in Hindi so the film can travel more in India and there'll be one Indian version and one international version. And you know, this is where, you know, when you have work with good actors, they step in and they protect the material for you. So Irfan stepped in and said, you know, uh, 
to translate this into Hindi uh, would be a disservice to it, you know. Uh, and uh, and then I, you know, it, he was a big supporter, and I was very happy to have that support. Congratulations, Batra, for making a film which is really uh, makes makes us believe that we do not only come into hall expecting how many songs that there will be. And thanks to Nimrat, he looks so wonderful and beautiful. Irfan, my, I want to ask a question to you. It's a little specific that I would like to know personally, and also maybe for others. <clears throat> you know, in the scene where. Uh, you get a dressing down there by your from your boss, you know. Never, don't cut your vegetables on these files. And while you're going out, you're moving out. You know, you turn around and you say half. You say I don't know. You just raise your hands. <laughs> so in such a scene, what I want to know is that are there a couple of two or three takes that you try and do? I mean, do you firstly say I don't know. If it doesn't work, then you just raise your hands. And how does it naturally flow? See, there's an inherent uh, humor in the film. It exists. So you are just trying to connect to that. And you're just trying to see how you can bring it out. So it was already there. And, uh, you know, Nawaz is also aware of uh, the humor which is there. That's why, you know, he improvises, you know, when, when he says, uh, why there's a smell of this uh, carrot and onion and things like that. So what he does, you know, he tries to yeah, yeah, cleanse correct, correct. and tries to, well, no, he just didn't do that, but, you know, he was trying to uh, do that. So that, as an actor, you are aware that what the situation demands, that there's a humor in it, but we shouldn't, we shouldn't, we shouldn't, you know, let it go. Uh, hi, congratulations for a wonderful movie. It was really a big treat uh, to watch Lunchbox and the delicious fare being cooked by Nimrat. It really made us hungry in the first half. <laughs> I wish you, you would have eaten that, what she cooked. Um, uh, one uh, very strong element I want to compliment the team is that the sounds were extremely authentic. The sound of the train, the sound of the, uh, the children playing, and it really uh, reminded me of my own journeys in the train. My understanding is that the dabbas never get mixed up. So how did you sell this idea to the dabbawalas? Have you, have you come across such an incident? Or, uh, you, you know, mixing up a dabba for almost a month I think I need uh, some kind of a reply on that. <laughs> sure, sure. Uh, we'll start a Wikipedia page for this. Uh, we made a, you, you think it's a mistake, which is great. But we made a really sort of, felt that we owed it to them to keep it on that line between a mistake or a miracle. Uh, so it could either be a, a mistake, you know, because they use these codes on Dabbas. So maybe it's a coding error, or uh, I, I think maybe it's it's sort of a miracle of the big city, you know. So we we made an attempt in the film to just keep it on that line, and you know we we don't explain the process. There's a lot of documentaries about the dabba walas that explain the process, how this dabba goes from A to B to C, and how it changes hands and what the coding system is and how it works. We didn't delve into that. We just sort of they are a device that connect our two characters, and uh, I don't think they make mistakes. Actually, some of the Dabbawalas who are in the movie are the same ones that I was hanging out with initially when I was trying to make that documentary. Uh, a lot of that group that's singing, you know, they are from that group that goes from Malat to Churchgate. And some of them saw the movie when we did a cast and crew screening, and uh, and they loved it. So, uh, I, I mean, I don't think it's a mistake, really, but, uh, you know, some people watch the movie and say, oh, you know, it's a mistake, and some people say it's a miracle. And Ritesh, your film has now traveled to a number of festivals and is finally going to be releasing next Friday. Uh, the box office for a lot of people is, in a way, a very important thing, a final frontier, so to speak. Uh, how are you feeling about that right now? I mean, what are your thoughts about the India release itself? Uh, I'm, I'm not... Uh I'm really looking forward to it, actually, because it's important, uh, you know, for all of us that the film, probably the most important thing is that it does well in India. Uh, after Khan, it became, like, the film was sold all over the world. Like, I, I would get emails from people I didn't know saying that, oh, I'm, the Israeli dist I'm an Israeli distributor, there's a bidding war for your film, and this is what we've done before, we are the best company for your film. Can you put in a good word for us with the sales agent? So I'd get emails like that from Israel, from Ukraine, and, and so so with the producers. Um, so the film's already sold everywhere. Like It's releasing in India first, then there's a German release, French release, and Sony's going to release it in the US. But the most important thing thing for us, like it's an emotional thing really, that it should really work in India. So you know we, we get to 
do the kind of work we like to do. Uh, so, I mean, I, I'm only speaking for myself, but uh, I think that's why it's important. That's really why it's important. So, uh, because you know, there have been there's so many great filmmakers, Indian filmmakers, who do great work. Uh, Mira does great work. Deepa Mehta does great work. And um, but uh, it's somehow been uh, harder to live in India and and keep doing the kind of work you like to do. So I th I think uh, if our film does well, if you know other films that that come after our film do well, uh, I, th I think two or three films need to do really well, so that so that we we I can live here and do the kind of work I like to do, and, and you know send my little girl to school, and you know all those all those good things. All right. Uh, before we uh, end the session, there's one question I've been wanting to ask Irfan since the time we got sitting here. Irfan, is it really true that you had to turn down Christopher Nolan's Interstellar? You really, I'm sure every Nolan fanboy in this room right now wants to know, did that really happen? See, one th first thing, uh, I haven't turned it down. Uh, there was a majburi. I couldn't go because they were asking for too much of time. And every day my son makes me feel guilty. I was told that you were feeling guilty. So, it's a very good thing. I was reading the script and I was like, Baba Christopher Nolan. I said, Babel, I said, why don't you give me to study? I said, you know, when you will be dying, I'll ask this. I'll tell him, I'll tell you that you have given me everything, but Baba Christopher Nolan, why didn't you do that? I said, Salih, you have to kill the girls in the line, Christopher, I'll do it, and you'll take the credit and tell the girls to the girls. So anyway, I didn't turn down, you know, it was a majburi, which way the studio was approaching me, and four months ago, they wanted to go here, this film was here, and then D-Day was released, and four months ago, it was a big story. So this is a big story, so it's a small story, which will come, you know, but I'm going to go here for four months, so, you know, I think it's a very important period for me here, and I'm going to go here for the journey here, and I'm going to go here for the journey here, and I'm going to go here for the journey here, and I'm going to go here for the journey here, and I'm going to go here, just trying to flourish the industry, you know, I just want to be part of it. The man who picks India over Christopher Nolan. That's about it, ladies and gentlemen. Thanks a lot for being here.